Epidemiological studies involving uh, large populations of psychiatric patients uh, since the 90s estimate that the potential aptitude toward violent behavior is moderate but significant. Psychiatric patients are more victim than agents of the violence. In this case, the acts have of va uh, variable severity from the insults to the homicide. On the other hand, those with schizophrenia, psychosis, and severe personality disorder have a high risk of serious violence. There are important epidemiological studies in which the risk factors are sampled in order to form prototypes <coughs> of violent individuals. I remember the famous work of the MacArthur Foundation, in which psychopathy and substance use were proven to be the major indicator of violence. The large amount of statistical and empirical information obtained made it possible to develop assessment methodologies, aquarial or semi-aquarial, to the use of appropriate evaluation scales. Patients with a psychiatric history are particularly re relevant clinical gauges. The presence of major mental illnesses, active symptoms, lack of insight, and absence of adequate therapeutic programs represent the element contributing to the passage of the criminal act and especially the recidivism. So, the acute symptoms do not always justify the recidivism. For example, both psychopaths and pedophiles, that is, those with high rates of violence, cannot, cannot be described as acute. Also, in contrast, schizophrenics or depressive patients may commit heinous crimes claiming to have felt well and not admitting guilt. From the data, it appears as though it is difficult, if not impossible, to make prediction of recurrence of violence, and so it seems better to prevent violence acts in as much as these acts cannot be predicted. In fact, if there exist illnesses, with common characteristics of symptoms, course, and prognosis, then it stands to reason that there are also patients where each one is different from the other with different specificities. Very serious psychiatric patients can be aggressive and violent, but there are also those who are chronically ill that have never been this way, and at least in their behavior. As my colleague uh, would say, we have considered in this context the crucial contribution that the psychodynamic approach based on birth theory may also provide for violence risk assessment. However, it is necessary to understand the risk that arises in the specific context to the interpersonal relationship that is established 
between the culprit of the crime and the victim. Violence is therefore not an innate quality found in human beings, nor an intrinsic evil, evil to us, but instead a behavioral symptoms of a severe absence of affectivity, called in Italian anaffettività. Knowledge of internal coldness of the patient allows for a more diagnostic evaluation. Regarding the categorical diagnosis, for example, we could say that if the human reality of the patient is destroyed by several parts, we cannot make a diagnosis of personality disorder even under the alternative model proposed by DSM. Five, it is necessary to think at psychosis. Concerning the psychopathological diagnosis, we could give some examples. A patient may have a delusion and not manifest it linguistically, but only in behavior. We can take the case of this Wanger's patient that decide to give his sick daughter a coffee. We can assume, if he does not say it, that he considered his daughter already dead. We cannot deny that he gifted her a useful object and that this person thinks with lucidity toward material reality, but we are affected by the extreme dehumanization of the gesture. The extremism of thought and clarity of the action are also characteristic of those who develop delusion about an end of the world catastrophe. Regarding this, a striking case is the story of Anders Breivik, the perpetrator of the Utoya massacre in Norway. Breivik declared himself sane and guilty, feeling a humiliation of every type of mental diagnosis. The first pool of experts declared him schizophrenic, reconstructing his manner and behavior, encouraging his entrance into forensic health facilities. In Italy, first among all the others, anticipating a debate that resonated all over Europe, the psychiatrist Massimo Fagioli spoke about paranoid schizophrenia, underscoring how the meticulous organization of criminal plans was indicative of an illness as supported by a pathological thought. In Europe and in Western democracy, leaving home one son an anti-Islamic campaign and killing 77 people as though they were ants at the June 44 amounts to being a schizophrenic, mentally ill greater than a terrorist. In the, in the evaluation of different mass murder, in case in which the culprit destroys everything, including themselves, it's, it is important to discuss the case of the pilot Andres Lubitz. We are not yet in possession of specific documents, but in this case, a diagnosis of depression or malignant narcissism had been proposed. Do you think it seems possible? Now, let's listen to what Professor Polese had to say. Thanks to Dr. Chesden and thanks also to Dr. Ponti who has worked with us in this relation and is here today. I work at the University of Naples where I teach and I work in psychiatric ward at the University Hospital Sant'Andrea in Rome um, and I work as a group psychotherapist in Rome too. A new approach to the relationship between law and mental health in the psychodynamic field implies most of all a method. which is not only limited to the observation of a criminological act, but at first can make a correct diagnosis 
as we said before. And then investigates on the non-conscious dynamics of the crime itself, particularly the savage crimes. Which are without a motive, that's the object, crimes without a motive. It is not a murder of a typical criminal, neither a fit of madness based on a confusional state or a fit of anger or hatred. It is a brutal murder which is planned in detail. The person is lucid and cold. How can we investigate these cases? The classical psychoanalytic approach considers that this event as a natural phenomenon related to the structural characteristics of the unconscious. Freud wrote in Totem and Tabu in 1913, the law only forbids men to do what their instincts incline them to do. Accordingly, we may always safely assume that crimes forbidden by law are crimes which many men have a natural propensity to commit. So, the psychoanalytic position indeed declares a postulate on the impossibility to know the unconscious, <coughs> that in German, in fact, is das Unbewusste, which means not knowable, and at the same time, declares a postulate on the violence that the unconscious is characterized of since the early childhood, as we all are aware. So, marking an unavoidable splitting between the conscious and the unconscious. The conscious is moral, the unconscious is evil. Splitting between the rational and the non-rational adulthood and childhood, ontogenetically and phylogenetically too, then, unconscious is considered a chaos, a cogent of seething excitement. It knows no bias, no good and evil, no morality. So, still nowadays, the main common point in psychodynamic therapies and psychoanalysis is the expectation that unconscious naturally presents features that seems to be pathological. Why can an idea of physiology not be reached when thinking of the unconscious mind? Why has mental development been considered a priori as initially pathological? differentiating it from the body organism, a further strategy to understanding the apparently sudden and inexplicable heinous crimes might be the study of the physiology of the mind, following a medical method. If not, we risk an ideological and religious position, especially if we believe the unconscious is evil and consider the unconscious to be psychotic falling into the old historical belief that illness equals evil. We will use the term non-conscious mind to distinguish it from the Freudian word unconscious. Moreover, our concept should be connected to biology to maintain a scientific meaning and not an ideological one. We have taken into consideration the human birth theory mentioned before by my colleague, written by Italian psychiatrist Professor Fagioli. He stated that at birth the brain is activated by an absolutely new stimulus given the intrauterine dark, the light, that being energy goes directly into contact with the cerebral substance to the eyes and the retina, which is cerebral substance. Recent biological data on fetal and postnatal studies support Fagioli's theory 
as studied by Professor Gatti and her team at the University of Siena in Italy. They show it like the light is directly in contact with cerebral substance in the retina, but there's an alternative system from the vision one where there are specific cells, ganglion cells, that are sensitive to light and have the unique capability to be directly in contact with the whole brain. <coughs> so, through an opsin conversion, the brain is activated by light energy through the firing of local cellulose. And around, uh, on an average, 20 seconds, there's the activation of uh, respiratory muscles and the first breath and the wing. From the brain act activation, the body and the mind start together. Those are some data supporting the theory. The main reaction is characterized by vitality and consists in a particular drive, which is not aggressive. It is inner to a fantasy in which, first, the inanimate external world presented by the light does not exist. <coughs> Simultaneously, through the neurosensitive trace left on the skin by the amniotic liquid <coughs> that a human body like us exists. This is called disappearance fantasy, fantasia di sparizione. That is the human specific capability to imagine. <coughs> the existence of a human body like us is the memory fantasy of the sensation had before. This physiological approach considers the non-conscious mind as the body, being pro-life and not destructive or naturally antisocial. As in medicine, it is the loss of this physiological condition to determine the loss of the sense of the other human being, like us, and the loss of our humanity. In particular, when vitality becomes low or is lost, joint presents itself as another drive. This is directed against the human world this time and not the inanimate one like at birth. Human affectivity and capabilities are compromised or lost and that condition called <coughs> an affectività, absence of affectivity, emerges and alters human relationships. The subject has lost his birth. This is compatible with a conserved rationality and with an organized conscious thought and behavior. The pathology is at a non-conscious level and what is lost is the relationship with the human. It is a non-conscious violence. Fagioli calls it invisible violence. This is a cover of a Saranago's book titled Blindness. It's very interesting as a representation of uh, an affectivity. So you can read it if you want to it up. In some serious case, through the unknown drive, the other human being becomes an object, like a thing. Let's remember the famous case of Cogne, I don't know if you, if you know that, where a mother killed her child, and Italy was very famous. While her dying baby was still on the floor, bleeding, she said to her husband, let's make another, like a broken glass to substitute with another. Moreover, if a delusion is present, like the other is at the devil, the heinousness might be understandable, and the risk that a crime has this characteristic is even higher. Futile reasons can justify an act of violence. In another famous Italian case, Chiatti, the subject killed two children because they won a game of cards. 
rationality helps to organize the crime perfectly, even more efficiently than in a usual crime, because there are no affections or emotion to hinder logical thinking and the management of timing and actions in the murder. In these cases, the motive cannot be sufficient to explain the crime and the hazelessness, or it is not even present. Let's see the case of Lubitz. Has he told his girlfriend he wanted his name to be remembered forever? Is this why he committed the crime? Without dyspnea, as we know from the investigation, and probably you can imagine he did not even blood, had blood pressure or heart rate alterations. He pushed the bottom and the plane was made to crash. He killed 150 people on 24th of March this year. Again, the diagnosis here is crucial in the schizophrenic logic, rationality, is untouched while the affectivity is lost and the contact with the body is lost. The schizophrenic person is like pure thinking. The idea that the world is being destroyed is a common symptom. In this case of Lubitz, he destroys people. A plane of Lufthansa the main German company, like destroying Germany, and together with this, he destroys the world. Did he create the null, the nothing, by acting out the annulment drive? Let's conclude with the following. If we do not look at the non-conscious mind, there cannot be any explanation or any idea in forensic psychiatry on the reasons why these heinous crimes occur. The Freudian approach is not based on a medical method, but considered a natural aggressiveness of the unconscious, this cannot be faced nor understood, nor changed like psychosis. The birth theory medical method, which means that the non-conscious is not wicked and illness is not evil, gives us different and more thorough diagnostic assessment at the psychodynamic level. Last, the approach based on this human birth theory allows us to better understand the criminal genetic and criminal dynamics of the acting out through the anonymous drive and the anaffectivita as the loss of vitality. Thank you for your patience.
in, uh, in the arts is very well represented, or in uh, a specific human relationship that is the relationship between uh, difference, that means man and woman, because different from yourself can make to emerge your non-conscious mind. Said that, in, in the illness, you have behind the behavior a non-conscious thinking, and that world must be examined to prevent probably the, the murder, the criminal act, and also to understand um, very well why the man or the woman did that. This uh, must uh, presume that you do not believe that this natural commits a crime, especially so uh, heinous crime. And when there's something like happened in Canada that you mentioned before, I don't know the case, so I can't say to you something about the person because I, I have not even heard about that. But it's sure that uh, something happened inside that mind. All you mean about the, the boy, no, I don't know, but I mean, we didn't know about it. In Italy, the, the newspapers didn't speak about that. In any case, there's the, the capability to be so cruel against a body like ours. So there's something missing in humanity. Well, he, he, he was conscious. He knew that this person was going to kill him. And if he didn't kill him right now, he would be killed. That was the delusion. So in a sense it was con conscious, but so what made it come up there? Yeah, but the point is that the, when you have illness at an unconscious level, consciousness can, can be not compromised. They are even more perfect than us. Yeah. Because they don't have emotions, they don't have affections that make them in conflict. There's a clear uh, relationship with the material reality that is conserved, while what is lost is a relationship with the non-material reality that is human reality. So there's no emotion, there's no recognizing their self in other human being. So they lost this image that we had at the birth. We, we have this intuition that there's another body like us, because we have the amniotic fluid neural sensation marked on the skin. So we are not desperated. We, we know that there's something. We have this intuition. If we lose that birth image, that, that capability to, to be open to others and to look for a human contact, we lose the birth and the human specificity that, in this sense, is not consciousness. Thank you. Are there any conditions for understanding um, you know, violence, extreme violence, dehumanization on a massive scale? For example, genocide, where a particular narrative, a particular ideology seems to get hold and people seem to be able to justify doing anything yeah. to themselves. Um, so, uh, could there be a, a role of I say cultural factors. Can cultural factors that operate on a large scale at the individual level in that sort of way? Yes. Yeah, it's very interesting. Um, because, uh, you know, as a psychodynamic psychotherapist, I have to ask myself all the time if there's something inside, even the ideology. Mm -hmm. For example, um, we know that recently were discovered the black, um, the black books by Martin Heidegger, who was um, hypothesized as the theorician of the Nazism because of his philosophy, but it was not really sure for many uh, philosophers why in these uh, black books he declares clearly that the Jewish must disappear. 
he talked about an intermento that is in a German, I don't remember. It's like making them nothing, materially nothing. So it's, it's some, there's something, you know, uh, that uh, can um, drive us toward our research about the annulment drive. So the, the, the question in, uh, that uh, in our group was uh, asked was why the Jewish? You know, beyond everything that it's already is already hypothesized, like they killed the Christ, uh, or I don't know, but they have no had no land. But in any case, and a very hard I answer that the same Fajoli uh, said was for nothing, because at the, the base of Heidegger thought that the pure logic, schizophrenic logic, was his hypothesis, for example. But it's very, you know, it, it's a different approach because you have to go very deep inside uh, and beyond the facts. But um, I think, and so we think that uh, if you do this, you can probably can um, distinguish better the promoter, violence promoter, uh, because there's also this other part of mind that we cannot, you know, cancel. But we have this historical mark by Freud and psychoanalysis that said, like a sort of original scene, that we are, you know, bad, we are evil, so this world must be controlled by rationality. But are we sure that if, if we go for non-rationality, we will feel bad? Or maybe we can stay better together. Maybe the world would have been different. <laughs> well, I wonder if uh, susceptibility to, if you like, a primitive aggression is something that which might be increased when some of the things that usually keep our lives going in a certain more or less coherent direction and uh, we uh, manage to keep perhaps some of our worst tendencies in check most of the time. And things like um, a person's sense of identity and a sense of connectedness with other people, part of society, that sort of thing, relationships. Um, usually that will keep things going, going along more or less coherent for most of the time. But I mean, some of the uh, literature, which I didn't have time to go into, is talk about things like invalidation of a person's sense of identity, where exactly. they feel discredited. In fact, I did um, hint at some of the literature on shame, which is when a person feels unacceptable and not accepted. It does seem that shame can have quite a powerful effect in terms of, uh, well, morally disengaging somebody and making it more likely to be a combination of other factors compared to other kind of inhibitions that's more likely for them drinking, etc, etc. Uh, and another thing is, the um, related aspect is invalidation of meaning. You know, we have our meaning frameworks, like what life, the universe, society, ourselves, other people, etc. mean. And, um, well, I'm reminded of, uh, a lot of people here refer to Kevin Howells, who very important uh, figure in the development of a cognitive behavioural perspective in, in the UK, and he was in Australia for a while. Well, he did his PhD thesis quite a lot of years ago on so-called over-controlled offenders, ones who normally are violent. In fact, normally are rather insensitive, you can But when they do commit an offence under particular conditions, it's usually much more violent in terms of uh, Bigger and destructive kind of reacts than you get from people that are more happy about it. Um, and I think Kevin interpreted it in terms of people's world view about relationships and themselves suddenly being proved massively wrong, which faces an individual with basically chaos. You know, the world doesn't make sense anymore. And it's, that combined with the provocation of some crucial point of an argument or a partner walking out or that sort of thing is what 
will give rise to this almost overturning of the whole, if I can describe it in those terms, overturning of this person system of construing and making sense of the world. And it's during that few seconds usually that this most primitive violence occurs before the old system typically reasserts itself and that people are often no trouble when they're in prison because they conform and all the rest of it. So, part of the reason I'm saying this, I wonder if there is a sort of scope for integration of time in other areas of research. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and indeed, uh, for example, about the primitivism, we have also to consider the art because the art started uh, just you knowing the caves uh, by primitive men. So probably, you know, uh, from the Homo sapiens, I think. And there was, yes, some aggression, but it was for surviving. It was, it, it was mainly against the nature, against the animals. We, I think we, we need the courage to consider that the aggressiveness can be also the natural aggressiveness can be also an ideological position. Because it's not a medical method to understand mind as the body. I think it's a, it's yeah. a change. Interesting term, survival. Uh, a few years ago I shared a stage with somebody who did a talk on the making of monsters. Yeah. And uh, I think we came to the conclusion that uh, there seems to be a common thread of situations in which people are perpetrate abhorrent violence, things like the raft of the Medusa, you know, the resort of cannibalism, and I think it's all about survival. But also, there's this theme in very destructive, dehumanizing ideologies like Nazis, you know, master race, you know, it's making reference to the pseudo evolutionary ideas. So it seems that people often justify things in terms of notions of survival, but also, I wonder, you know, I, I the time the actual mechanisms that originally arose for us. Well, it, it's, a, it's a position uh, that is not really medical. It's like, consider that it's logical. Ah, it's anthropological, yes, probably. But uh, as a medical doctors, uh, we should imagine that a heart, that the heart is uh, sane, while after uh, becomes, you know, can become uh, ill. Otherwise, it's like we imagine that the heart attack is the, at the beginning of the life, of the life, and then it's okay, and then the heart attack is a regression to the beginning of the life. It's it's very strange that you think we think that about mind, and um, yeah, I think yeah, it's uh, it's difficult. But the first thing is diagnosis. And this concept of physiology and of illness. It's very difficult to have about uh, the, the human mind because we have uh, millions of years uh, or, or at least thousands of years of uh, prejudice and uh, prejudgments and uh, ideologies uh, in different religions, in philosophy. It's, it's very, very difficult. But if you just think about our experience with a newborn. When you take a newborn and you embrace it, it, you cannot say he does not think. You cannot say he does not feel you. He does not have already a personality, a sort of, you know, tastes about world. So we have to think that as human being, he can think, but thinking is a different kind of thinking. So maybe it's not conscious. Uh, I would like to ask about the HCR20. Sorry, what? The HCR20. Yes. You ah, yeah. apply this uh, for this for, for inhibitions. Uh, yes, yes. For, for
it's uh, Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's probably a <laughs> <laughs> 